In the fiery light of the evening sun, a column bearing shields, spears, and shining steel salads ascended the rocky slopes of Mount Verilin. Ludmilla, along with Raoul, Olga, and three elder liches, floated in the skies behind a nervous-looking Nemel Gran, who was observing the troop movements below. This is a lot different when you have an audience, the Imperial Science said. Maybe you should join the League, Ludmilla said. We have another class of commanders starting in the Bronze League this coming season. And me, my lady? I'm nothing like a commander. I believe nobles are fundamentally a type of commander, Ludmilla said. It would be difficult to explain their skill set otherwise. Furthermore, if you're one of the imperial arcanists described in Countess Waldenstein's treatise, you're a type of mage commander that I would love to have in the military academy. MMH. For some reason, Miss Gran seemed to easily digest the roundabout assertions about the job class system that Ludmilla fed her, interpreting them as common sense. As far as Ludmilla could tell, the reason was that her household education was quite different from those of the average imperial family. This was rather impressive considering the imperial administration's aggressive drive to standardize everything according to their requirements, which included effectively forcing its elite to undergo brainwashing by the Imperial Magic Academy's curriculum. But doesn't that mean I have to attend classes? Miss Grant said, General Ray is trying to get me to finish my education at the military university, too. Have you spoken with him recently? Ludmilla asked. Back when I picked up the last batch of migrants, my lady, Miss Grant's golden hair whipped in the chilly wind. How has he been doing? Oh, you know him, Miss Grant laughed weakly. He's thrown himself into whipping the Sixth Army group into shape ever since the old general retired. The entire feel of their headquarters is different from the old days. It used to be a pretty laid-back place. Everything was slow and steady. Members of the air wing slept in a warm bed every night and got three hot meals a day. Now, even they are being subjected to endless drills. I suppose I cannot imagine the man ever relaxing. For your part, I think you should take every opportunity to improve. Higher level education in the Empire isn't restricted to semesters and you can participate in classes anytime you wish in Warden's Vale. I think my hair will turn white before I hit twenty, my lady. I still have Dame Verilin's territory to manage as well, you know? You could hire an Elder Lich to do most of the data-related work. They love being useful and it will free up most of your time. Maybe when we get a bit bigger there are still plenty of things I'm not entirely confident about yet, speaking of which, have you spoken with Dame Verilin recently, my lady? Ludmilla turned her gaze eastward to the distant sensation that marked her companion's location. She was too far to contact through their telepathic bond, so the last she had heard from her was when she left to investigate the jungles beyond the Draconic Kingdom. I have not, she said. Oh, that's strange. She's contacted me three times via message over the last month or so. Was she asking about her taxes? Not exactly, Miss Gran frowned. She's asking about the concept of taxes themselves. In addition to tax policy, I've also gotten questions about domestic security, common law, and trade. Dame Verilin has never expressed an interest in how all that works before. She must be trying to impress someone, Ludmilla smirked, then motioned to the slopes below. The company is getting close. The Goblin Company crossed the tree line, which abruptly transitioned to a treacherous, ice-bound landscape. The source of the anomaly was a nice elemental that had wandered down from the peak to propagate the powerful elemental influence emanating from Elish Nish's domain. They've entered the elemental's territory, Raoul said. Why doesn't it attack them? We've found that they'll only come from far away if there's a significant enough elemental disturbance in their realm to warrant attention, Miss Gran said. The first patrol to encounter an ice elemental found that out the hard way when they tried to establish a camp along the tree line. We can use that to our advantage. Miss Gran cupped her hands around her mouth. Elemental spotted. Form defensive lines. The sound of goblinoid voices issued from below and the company rapidly rearranged itself. Within a minute, a rank of shields three deep had formed in front of the lighter elements of the company. Light them up. Miss Gran commanded. Behind the heavy infantry, three goblins set their torches ablaze. The ice elemental immediately ceased its placid wandering and tumbled straight down towards the company like a miniature avalanche. I did not know that they were that sensitive to elemental incursions, Ludmilla said. Crazy, huh? Miss Grant said, 
they are just as bad as those maids who can detect dust in the most obscure places. Seemingly all of Ludmilla's maids could do that and it was a disturbingly accurate ability. They would even pop up the moment she tracked mud into the manor. Did that make them elementals of cleanliness? The ice elemental smashed into the goblin lines, which buckled, but didn't break. With a collective shout, the goblins pushed back and enveloped the raging elemental, which was still trying to get at the flaming torches. It wasn't long until the elemental was completely immobilized. That tactic is really handy, Miss Gran marveled. You said that your people used this in the past? It is a countermeasure for strong opponents, Ludmilla nodded. All else being equal, an ogre or bugbear can easily overpower a single human, but they cannot overpower six at once. Immobilizing them like this makes it trivial for supporting spearmen to take them down. The goblin army that invaded last year also employed the same tactic, so it's probably a common one for the weaker races. On the slope below, light infantry armed with spears came forward to stab at the trapped elemental through the gaps of its makeshift enclosure. The ice elemental roared and thrashed in vain until it ultimately collapsed into a pile of fragments. One of the goblin mystics cautiously came forward, poking through the remains before straightening to hold up a glowing blue shard in a pair of wooden tongs. Good work. Miss Grant smiled down at them, let's go home. Elish Nish's seneschal watched the company return down the slope with a satisfied look. I hope this works, she said. That is what we're trying to find out, Ludmilla said. If it does, it will be another piece of evidence to support the validity of Miss Lanez's theory. What will it look like in the winter if we succeed? Normal, I suppose? Ludmilla replied, you are on a south-facing slope but the area will still have snow for at least two months out of the year. If the ice elementals take over, your village is going to look like the ice house at the Faculty of Alchemy. Dame Verilin never mentioned any of this, Miss Gran sighed. Well, dragons seem to dictate the elemental balance in an area, so it is not surprising that she would think nothing of it. Rather than finding faults with your circumstances, I think it would be far better to take advantage of them. In that aspect, Ludmilla was similar to a dragon, though her influence of the primal mana of the area was the result of her absorbing negative energy and thus allowing the life energy inherent to her territories to overflow. Unfortunately, this was very difficult to assert without revealing that she was the source of the anomalous conditions. She wasn't sure that those studying the phenomenon would believe her even if she did. I admit that it has its perks, Miss Grant said, but I also understand why countries wouldn't allow this to happen. It's like sustaining a perpetual border conflict. But it doesn't seem that hard, Olga said. These ice elementals are supposed to be gold rank targets by old adventurer standards. When I was a little kid, I thought that meant only armies could stop one. I did use an army to stop one, Miss Gran noted. A small army. Only a single company was deployed, but it takes a whole army to perpetually maintain this kind of effort. WH what I meant was that if goblins can defend against them, then so can humans. In my old village, part of our taxes went to paying adventurers in case something nasty came around. But adventurers are super expensive. They keep all the loot from their commissions, too. Why didn't the nobles use the money to raise knights and armed retinues, instead? They could even make money from the materials that they got. There were a few theories as to why that was. From an economic standpoint, maintaining professional armsmen was a continuous strain on a thief's finances. Adventurers could instead be commissioned for the brief periods that they were necessary, effectively turning them into a trained mercenary force that the hundreds of fiefs around each guild branch could call on for security. On paper, it was a sound idea as situations that required adventurers were relatively rare. In practice, however, response times to tribal raids and predation by monsters varied widely and adventurers could even pass over on a commission if they felt that it wasn't worth their time and talent. Additionally, threats from the wilderness weren't the only threats to a realm. As more and more of the nobility turned to more economical security options, their martial institutions decayed. The vast majority of Reistais and the Empire had forgotten how to fight and thus became vulnerable to those who still could. Reistais experienced this in the form of unchecked criminal activity that crippled society as a whole. The Empire experienced it in the form of the bloody Emperor and his use of the Imperial Army to establish and maintain his autocratic rule. Both countries relied upon, or formally relied upon, depending on what part of the Empire one was in, 
Powerful individuals like adventurers and workers who effectively held a monopoly on readily deployable strength above mithril rank. Let us explore that, shall we? Ludmilla said, we can even have Miss Gran help out. Me? Miss Gran squeaked. Of course, Ludmilla smiled. It is something you're already doing here, so you can serve as a practical reference. We should return to the village first, however. I do not want to waste any more of your mana than necessary floating up here. Ah, yeah, Nemel sighed. I need to be more aware of that these days. They went back down the mountainside, steadily picking up speed as they skimmed over the treetops. The development of Miss Gran's first village had progressed to the point where a noticeable clearing was created in the forest. For the time being, they were preparing permanent dwellings for the coming winter, so it had the characteristic look of a frontier lumber camp. Plus goblins. Miss Gran, Ludmilla asked, will you be going ahead with your development plans in the spring? Hmm, that's a good question, my lady, the Seneschal answered. I originally wanted to farm potatoes, but we've been farming elementals instead. Honestly, the latter is more lucrative while we're still small. I would hardly call 15,000 subjects small, Ludmilla smirked. You were right, of course. It just doesn't feel that way. The goblins are so low maintenance that I hardly have to think about how they fit into the grand scheme of things. A single circuit over the village decelerated them to an acceptable landing speed and they alighted on one of the village center's wooden balconies. Welcome back, Ida rose from her desk. How did everything go? We managed to beat the thing without any casualties, Miss Gran replied, throwing her mantle over a chair. It dropped a piece of elemental ice, as usual. Did anything change? Change? Oh, no. I don't think it's supposed to warm up right away or anything like that. Well, maybe it did, but the surroundings didn't suddenly transform into a blossoming alpine meadow. Miss Gran went to clear away her tools from the office's central table. Ludmilla had the unfamiliar contraptions as they were carefully placed into a wooden case. Your wants have caused quite the stir, she said. They have? Miss Gran looked up from the table. I didn't think second-tier ones would be considered all that special here. It is not so much the tier of the ones as it is the spell you have been charging them with. Ah, that makes sense. They're one of House Gran's most popular products, so I figured I'd see how well they do here. How many of them sold? All of them, Ludmilla replied. I mentioned that you put some ones up at the magic shop and she went to take a look. Within minutes, Nobe teleported over and cleaned them out. The ones in question were loaded with Jolt, an evocation spell that inflicted lightning damage. Apparently, it was a spell unknown to the Sorceress Kingdom. Nobe? The Seneschal's eyes grew wide, as in the famous wizard from darkness? The very same, Ludmilla nodded. Out of curiosity, why are the ones so popular in the Empire? It's because Jolt can't be dodged, Miss Gran idly fidgeted with an unenchanted wand. The majority of evocation spells can be avoided if the target is nimble enough. Sneaky types are especially good at it. I used to hear horror stories all the time from my Air Wings Elite War Wizards about it. They drop a fireball on a cluster of goblins only to find out that most of them manage to get out of the explosion slightly singed. Even lightning can be dodged. I see. What is the trade-off for Jolt being undodgeable? Trade-off? Miss Gran frowned, magic doesn't work like that. My lady. The spell does what it's allowed to do. Jolt will unceremoniously fry most targets on the spot, but a powerful monster would be able to withstand enough punishment to reach the caster. I think most of my family's customers use the ones to quickly deal with demi-human mystics from a distance or as an emergency sidearm just in case something manages to sneak in close. It seems like an extraordinarily practical spell, Ludmilla said. How come I do not see other mages in the region use it? Miss Grant put the wand away and placed her crafting kit on a nearby shelf. Jolt is an heirloom spell, she said. One of my ancestors developed it a long time ago. The spell itself is much older than the Baharuth Empire. If that is the case, how come someone has not researched something similar since then? That's a complicated question, the Seneschal took a seat at the table. I'm not sure how much you understand about arcane research, but it's an inherently selfish activity. A mage's knowledge of magic is reliant on what they practice, so any research that they conduct will always be related to themselves. 
Arcane casters also tend to guard their magical knowledge jealously, so magical research is a very exclusive field where prospective researchers nearly always start from scratch. I think most people are familiar with this, regular civilians tend to see it in the form of alchemists having secret formulas or artificers selling proprietary magic items. Many of those items will literally blow up in the face of people who try to investigate their secrets. Surely there must be mages who consider the greater magic community, Lud Miller said. What you have described sounds like magical research is a mostly stagnant field, or at least one that treads the same ground ad nauseum through countless parallel efforts. That's pretty much what it is, Miss Grand shrugged and laughed weakly. Even in the Empire, they only teach you the basics of magic in the Imperial Magic Academy. The Imperial Army's war wizards all learn the same set of spells, though one could argue that standardization in the military is a good thing. I hear that the Imperial Ministry of Magic isn't much better, everyone's research is their own and they mostly keep to themselves even amongst their peers. They're invested in themselves and they compete for the investment of the Imperial Administration. I don't envy the PR Countess Waldenstein for her new post as Imperial Head Court Mage, she would have to keep an eye out for that. Independent research was encouraged at the Magical Academy and Warden's Vale, but she never intended for it to undermine the sense of community and learning she wanted to foster in every professional field. Ida came around with tea, placing painted clay cups around the table. Ludmilla pulled out several sheets of paper from her infinite haversack and set them down in front of her. Let us speak about what Olga mentioned before, she said. I believe it has been touched on here and there in past conversations, but we have never thoroughly explored the topic. As officers in the Sorceress Kingdom's Royal Army, we enjoy some very unconventional advantages compared to our neighbors and I suspect this will continue to be the case going forward when we work in other theaters of operation. First of all, how does a fief in Rias ties raise its armed forces? Through levy obligations, Raoul said. That is probably the most commonly known method, Ludmilla nodded, but levy obligations aren't indefinite. Once they have served their time, levied men will return to their regular occupations. How would a lord go about raising a retinue of professional men at arms? They'd look around for big, strong men, Raoul replied. That can probably be done while the lord's going from village to village holding court. All right, Ludmilla said. Say our lord finds some big, strong men. How does he secure them for his retinue? Those men have no legal obligation to work for him as armsmen. Many people would rather not risk themselves in combat and it is often the case that the most hale and hearty individuals are heirs to a tenancy or workshop. Raoul looked down at the table, drumming his fingers against its polished surface. Getting an heir to join would probably be impossible without coercion, he said. I guess you would have to make the position attractive enough that the other people you find would want to join. And how would the Lord do that? Pay them enough money, Olga said. Providing them with a comfortable standard of living is a good start, Ludmilla said. What else? Special privileges, Raoul said. But wouldn't some people want to work as a retainer anyway? For prestige or connections or whatever? That would depend on both the person being recruited and the lord, Ludmilla replied. For instance, would you have taken an offer to become an armsman for your former lord, Raoul? No, Raoul made a sour face, that guy was a jerk. His retainers were bullies, too. Ludmilla frowned, trying to recall which territory Raoul's family came from. If she wasn't mistaken, it was one of the baronies east of the city near the imperial border. That baron had fled to Riestais with his family however, and his land was now a part of Wagner County. That wouldn't be a deal-breaker for some people, Nemel noted. In fact, there are plenty of imperial houses with a reputation for being bad that end up being attractive to equally terrible people. In the end, Ludmilla said, a lord can only leverage things like prestige and connections, good or bad, if their house has cultivated them in the first place. That, in turn, affects what sort of people come to work for them. In the case of a civilian noble in the heartlands of Riestais, they have little to no martial reputation and likely none of the required institutional development to train decent armsmen. This, in turn, does not inspire much confidence if said noble comes up to someone and asks if they want to fight demi-human tribes for them. But most nobles are like that, aren't they? Raoul asked. They are, Ludmilla said, which has become a huge problem for Riestais. Their nobles may be capable administrators and politicians, but strength can steal away any order and prosperity that they manage to build. 
things have degraded to the point that it is said that criminals effectively run at least half of the country. Let's ignore that unfortunate fact for now and continue building our army, shall we? What about knights? Olga asked. Knighting someone does not guarantee an effective security force, Ludmilla answered. In many ways, it may hurt more than help. Knights have responsibilities beyond being combatants and not everyone has the character or education to be a proper knight. Additionally, it doesn't magically solve all of the logistical issues in raising and maintaining an army and a single knight does not have the power projection of a regiment of armsmen. A lord is better off raising a knight after they have a functional regiment of armsmen. That way, the knight can act as the commanding officer of that regiment. This is harder than I thought it would be, Olga pouted. I am sure that many nobles in Rias ties feel the same way, Ludmilla said. A title means little without the de facto power to exercise all the authority it grants. So if our lord is in that situation, Raoul said, the only thing they can really do is pay people more. If they hand out too many rights and privileges, a single bad guy who joins up can make a huge mess of things. She uncapped her pen and set it to the paper. Paying an armsman not only means providing a living wage for an individual, Ludmilla told them as she listed some figures on the sheet, but also their families. If a rural household is frugal, a family of four in Rias ties can survive on the equivalent of twelve silver per month. To entice someone to work for our lord, we are looking at triple or quadruple that amount depending on whether they are supplied with equipment. This brings us to the next expense, arms and armor. Most blacksmiths do not fashion either so our lord will probably have to import everything from the nearest city. Training equipment is necessary, as well, this is getting expensive. It's not as expensive as living in the city, Nemel said. I guess that's why most of the imperial knights and their families live out in the country. Olga was wondering why nobles in Riestais opted to rely on adventurers, Ludmilla said. This is probably the biggest reason why. A single armsman with the capabilities of a copper rank adventurer costs roughly four gold a month. A company of a hundred armsmen costs the lord forty platinum per month. When a lord's territory is threatened by something that requires adventurers perhaps once every two or three years, the adventurer guild becomes the more economical choice by far. But what about that other stuff you brought up? Raoul asked, armsmen aren't just for fighting raiders and monsters. They're there to keep all of that other trouble under control, as well. Riestais's nobles should realize that. I am sure that they do, Ludmilla replied, but criminal elements are a different sort of beast. Tribal raiders come around for food, cause light damage, then return to their homes. A criminal organization is a parasitic entity that subverts authority as it grows. Riestais's criminal underground has grown to the point that I believe most nobles have simply given up trying to fight them. Given up? Raoul's expression twisted in confusion. How can they just give up? Shouldn't the nobles want to be in control? According to a report from a few years ago, the criminal syndicate infesting Riestais had significantly more military power than Riestais itself. The only way any of its nobles might be able to pull themselves out of that predicament is to lease a death knight from the sorcerer's kingdom. Then they should, Raoul grumbled. Ludmilla let out a short laugh, but the plight of their western neighbor was far from humorous. It was truly a case where imprudent decisions that had been made decades or even generations in the past were now visiting any number of difficult woes upon the country. One could say they had gone in the exact opposite direction as the empire in terms of policy. Anyway, she said as she flipped to a fresh sheet of paper, let us take a look at our practical reference now. Miss Gran, what, is something the matter? Elish Nish's senishal shifted slightly in her seat with an expression that was a cross between discomfort and embarrassment. It's um, I'm not sure how to put this, my lady, she said, but all of these budget calculations have left me feeling just a bit guilty. The statement caused Ludmilla to examine the imperial scion through every measure available to her. Despite her scandalized look, she wasn't any more out of line with her sovereign's will than usual, which was to say not much at all. Guilty about budget calculations? Ludmilla sent a calm look across the table at Miss Gran, would you care to explain what you mean by that? Miss Gran squirmed for a few moments under Ludmilla's gaze before finally providing a reply. Um, she said, it's just that I'm probably not a very good case study. I haven't been paying my goblins anything at all. Olga and Raoul sent unveiled looks of disgust in Miss Gran's direction. The elder lich standing behind Olga looked up from its clipboard. 
Does this constitute a breach of labor rights? The crimson points of light in its eye sockets flared. Did Dame Verilin instruct you to not pay the goblins? Ludmilla asked. She didn't, my lady, the seneschal replied, but she was still quite pleased when she learned about it. Ludmilla rose from her seat. Miss Gran flinched as she placed a hand on her shoulder. You are a chivalrous woman, Miss Gran, she said. D don't say that. The seneschal cried, it isn't as if I want to appear chivalrous in regards to this. I already told you that I feel guilty about it. I know, Ludmilla returned to her seat. You are compensating them in some way, yes? I'm trying to figure it out, my lady, Miss Gran replied, but everything's been moving so quickly that I haven't been able to come up with any arrangements that satisfy me. I went from moving here at the beginning of summer to having 15,000 goblins by the end of it. That is understandable, Ludmilla said. What is your current arrangement? The closest precedent I'm familiar with is a forester contract, so I decided to start with something along those lines. No wonder you have 15,000 goblins. Miss Gran held her hands out helplessly. I didn't know this would happen. At first, I thought it would be fine until I figured something out. Then, the forest was suddenly filled with goblins. Beyond anything else that has happened, I think it's this that's thrown my development plans into chaos the most. A forester's contract was exactly as it sounded, it granted the contract holder certain rights, such as hunting and fishing, forage, and timber harvesting in a lord's forests in exchange for their expertise in woodland management and provision. It was the occupation that employed most of the rangers in the human countries nearby, though foresters usually didn't recognize themselves as one. Are they generating any revenues? Ludmilla asked. Not much relative to the sheer number of them, Nemel sighed. They circulate resources internally and barely anything comes out, so trade taxes are dismal. Never mind that, it's as if their goal is stretching their resources out to support as many people as possible. That is how goblins usually are, I suppose, Ludmilla said. Their advantage is in their numbers, so having a few more goblins around is worth far more than securing a comfortable lifestyle in their minds. I can see that now, my lady, the seneschal said. They don't keep track of anything either so it's impossible to tax them fairly. Since they self-organize on basic level so well, why not just manage them as groups rather than individuals? Miss Gran stood up and went to fetch a binder from a nearby cabinet. I've been considering that, she said as she placed the binder on the table between them, but I'm supposed to be establishing ten agricultural villages along the valley. I can't settle into any permanent arrangements that might get in the way of what I promised Dame Verilin. Even the most innocent misunderstandings inflict all sorts of trauma on her. Why not just have goblin farmers? Raoul asked. Goblin farmers, huh? The seneschal settled back into her seat. I can't recall any legends that mention goblins cultivating fields. After watching mine for the last few months, I think if I tell them that they can grow food in dirt, they'll just eat dirt to save time. I don't think they're that stupid, Raoul said. It's not a matter of stupid, Miss Gran said, it's whether they think they can do it or not. The last thing I need is thousands of starving, sick goblins. You have seen plenty of success having your human migrants mentoring the goblins, Ludmilla noted. Why not continue things along that vein? I am, my lady. The problem is that it's too slow relative to our population growth. My only hope is that they start teaching one another and somehow conveniently fill all of the roles that the fief needs. So do you still plan on bringing in farmers from the Empire in the spring? Ludmilla asked, that should help with vocational training, assuming the new migrants are willing to work with the goblins. Plenty of people have already signed up at our agency in our winter, Miss Gran answered. I'd hate to disappoint them. Also, I want at least some pot at uh, agriculture. I just don't think the farms can be as expansive as I first envisioned because the goblin population is so huge. If the land cannot support them, they will migrate. Migrate where? Nemel frowned, don't tell me Countess Corlin is going to issue a complaint because a hundred goblins decided to pack up their stuff and move into one of her orchards. That might be funny to see. Despite her outward displays of perfect composure, Clara still wasn't entirely comfortable around other races, tribal demi-humans, especially. If a group of them moved onto her territory, Clara would probably scream for Ludmilla to do something, they would probably go and conquer the land across the river, first. 
Given their training and equipment, they may succeed in spreading their influence over a large part of the upper reaches, is that all right? Miss Gran asked, I know that Reestai's law doesn't prohibit conflict between territories, but I haven't heard of anything like that happening in over a century. It occurs rarely to settle certain disputes, Ludmilla answered. Personally, I would like to see how things develop. Wilderness tribes are always characterized as savage and violent, but that does not make very much sense in this situation given what I know of them. Does that mean any conquest will add to Dame Verilin's territory? No. The provisions of the special administrative area only apply to the independent tribes that dwell there. I believe that undesirable outcomes would manifest if outsiders started to sponsor the activities of certain tribes. At any rate, we should continue our class discussion. Compared to our Ties example, how did Miss Gran raise her armed forces? By being a hob human, Olga said. A hob? Correct, Ludmilla nodded. Miss Gran cleverly took advantage of goblin social hierarchy and unified the local tribes. The goblinoid sense of hierarchy is so strong that it transcends race. One will often see goblins in tribes of ogres and trolls, even when they are subjected to slavish conditions. But how can we compare what's happening here to a noble's efforts to raise armed forces in Reistai's? Raoul asked, nobles don't force people to join them by beating them up. I didn't beat them up, Miss Grand protested. They are the ones that mistook my offer for a challenge and I mostly used sleep spells to win. Olga and Raoul seemed unconvinced. Miss Gran was a war wizard, after all. One may interpret this as the power of culture and institutions on recruitment, Ludmilla said. The broad, physical weakness of goblins belies the fact that they appear to be born soldiers. That aspect of their nature is so strong that they will independently form military units once they find a hobgoblin to lead them. This is a powerful cheat compared to what humans need to accomplish the same results. So Miss Gran is just feeding them. Raoul made a face. If we were to frame things in more formal terms, Ludmilla told him, she is allowing tribes to dwell on her land. In exchange for the forester contract that she mentioned previously, each tribe is contributing warbands as the major part of their tribute. Miss Gran, in turn, has turned those warbands into her territory's security force. Simultaneously, she is trying to encourage the tribes to participate in local industries and familiarize them with the society she is building. Overall, Miss Gran has come up with a highly effective strategy that has the effect of investing the goblin tribes heavily in her territorial development. I didn't know I was doing all of that, Miss Gran said. I was just doing what I felt was right. You may find that it is the best way to do things, Ludmilla smiled slightly. Even so, one should not neglect to analyze the outcomes of one's decisions and why they occurred. You may have also been influenced by your background as an imperial scion. Fundamentally, the Empire uses the same strategy with the Imperial Knights. Why does it feel as if we share so many similarities with the tribes? Olga asked, if you take a human barony and call it a clan, then each village in the barony can be a tribe living off of the land that's been allocated to it. That is because we do share many similarities with the tribes, Ludmilla answered. Our loyalties are effectively tribal loyalties. Families are loyal to family above all else. Villagers put the well-being of their village before the fief as a whole. The king of the kingdom is lucky if the subjects of his vassals regard him as anything more than a name. Many of the political and economic systems that we employ in our society aren't much more advanced than what the tribes use. People tend to look down on tribes due to their unfamiliarity with them. Ego and comforting lies do the rest. In reality, there are tribes out there that are far more advanced than Reistai's or the Empire, like the Konos and the Confederation of the Sandstone Forest east of the Katza Plains. Then why can't we do the same thing? Miss Grand just started a few months ago and she has an army that can beat up any baronial retinue. I bet she could win against the average count, as well. It's like the nobles screwed up. Miss Grand glanced nervously at Ludmilla, as if she expected to be ordered to conquer a county in Reistai's as the next practical lesson for the pair of commanders in training. I do not disagree with your assessment, Ludmilla said. At the same time, it is hard to pin down any single cause for the blunder. We have discussed some economic rationale for it, which is combined with the relative safety of a fief and the availability of mostly effective security contractors in the form of adventurers, workers, and other mercenary groups. Another reason is the centralization of power, as has happened in the Baharuth Empire. The emperor suffers no threats to his authoritarian rule, 
which is upheld by military force. To ensure this, he has stripped the nobility of their obligations and rights when it comes to the maintenance of territorial armies. They are legally barred from raising personal regiments even if they want to. Still, what we can broadly term martial culture is always present in some form, attempting to ensure that security concerns are always addressed. Take the science of the martial nobility, for instance. People like myself are born and bred for personal combat and military leadership. A career as a military governor is assumed rather than considered. My thought process is I'm a frontier noble, what does that mean? What should I be doing? What is my role? In what form does that role manifest in the system which I am a part of and how do I secure that position? Compare this to what the average civilian in a rural village considers, which we discussed just now. The fact that it must even be considered is telling in itself. In addition to financial concerns, negative connotations can be attached to military service. In Reistize, for instance, how the community feels about the levy, along with the tales and condition of those who return from carrying out their obligations can and will be assumed to be the norm for professional soldiers. A village's negative experiences with tribal raids and bandit activity add risks to the imagination that dissuade them from serving as part of the local lord's armed retinue. People would want to join because of raids, Raoul said. To protect their families or get back at the people who attacked them. Also, boys play soldier all the time and everyone looks up to strong warriors. As long as they aren't horrible people, anyway. You are not incorrect, Ludmilla admitted, but the outcome of those things is varied. For every man who wants to fight back, there is another who tries to avoid another confrontation. Every man who wants to fight back may also be dissuaded by family members who fear what may happen if their primary breadwinner does not come home one day. Boys playing soldier usually only lasts until they become young adults and, while the strong are admired by all, few follow in their footsteps. Because of the cultural and societal framework in a place like Reistais, attempting to recruit military forces is not only expensive, but the recruiter also tends to end up with the dregs of society. I'm not sure if I'd call the Imperial Knights dregs, Miss Gran said. Even if they recruit spares and vagrants in urban centers, the army's training will turn them into functional soldiers. Yes and no, Ludmilla said. The Imperial Army is an evolution of the Empire's martial aristocracy, whose members have transformed the military from an institution of the rural elite, as it is in Reistise, to one of the state as a whole. They have done exceedingly well in building it into what it currently is but several schisms are still present. For instance, there is a clear divide between martial aristocrats, landed imperial knights, and the common rank and file. Imperial science enter the imperial army as officers under the assumption that their education and upbringing qualify them for a position of authority. This is, for the most part, true, but it can serve as a barrier for talented commoners who join the imperial army through regular recruitment. Instead of immediately becoming an officer and focusing on a career as a commander, like General Ray did, a commoner spends years or even decades as an infantryman before becoming a sergeant. From there, it may take just as long to become a captain. Rising to commander as a commoner through conventional means is practically unheard of in the Imperial Army even though the majority of the army is made up of commoners. To further stress my point, every single general in the Imperial Army was born and raised as a noble. I hadn't considered it along those lines, Miss Gran crossed her arms over her midriff with a thoughtful look. But is that any reason to raise commanders purely as commanders like my lady is doing with Raoul and Olga? Yes, Ludmilla nodded. There is no need for a backline commander to train as a frontline combatant. Limits exist for what most people can achieve, and it is hardly prudent or fair to squander a child's potential for the sake of traditional flawed common sense. I believe that the most common argument for the traditional approach the Imperial Army takes is that officers need to be soldiers before they can command them, but the specific concerns that the argument underscores can be addressed through alternative means. Assuming the vast majority of individuals were capped at gold, so to speak, becoming an exceptional commander as a commoner in the Imperial Army was an impossible task. A spare recruited from an urban center might have one or two levels in civilian job classes and then gain several levels in a warrior class while serving in an infantry role. This was in line with the notion that veteran imperial knights were comparable to silver rank adventurers, so commoners who aspired to become commanders only had a handful of levels to squeeze in the relevant job class levels by the time they were promoted to positions of leadership. 
This meant there was simply no way for them to compete with people like General Ray, who would have triple to quadruple the commander class levels, if not more. No amount of familiarity with what life as a rank-and-file soldier was like could make up for the slew of skills and abilities that a powerful commander could bring to bear on the battlefield. In the ill-conceived notion that people of merit could be whatever they wished to be so long as they applied themselves, the Empire guaranteed that none of their common folk could be at their best outside of the vocation that they were born into. Since the economics of the region disincentivized the pursuit of high civilian job class levels, even that only rarely occurred. So the Imperial Army, Miss Grant said, or, rather, the Imperial Administration lowers the challenges faced by recruitment efforts by normalizing the notion that anyone can become an Imperial Knight through its propaganda? That is correct, Ludmilla said. The Imperial Army has evolved to serve the Empire's needs, thus they can train functional soldiers as you have mentioned. Ultimately, however, they cannot break out of the mold of Imperial society, all they can do is work within its constraints. A sort of staircase to generational advancement has been developed, commoners who render exceptional service become landed imperial knights. Landed imperial knights raise children who gain some of the advantages that martial science enjoy, with parents passing down the skills, knowledge, and connections that they've cultivated as career soldiers. As the cycle repeats itself from generation to generation, the empire eventually ends up with new martial lineages that produce scions who can achieve what their ancestors could not. So much for being a meritocracy, Raoul mumbled. The Empire has twisted the term quite a bit, Ludmilla smirked. The Imperial Army is one of the better scenarios, where a form of generational merit can be achieved, which is ironically the very thing the Emperor has been dismantling in the civilian aristocracy. They also do not recruit commoners by asserting that they can rise to the top of an army group, instead presenting what is achievable and the benefits of attaining those levels of achievement, which are attractive to many. For the vast majority of its citizens, however, meritocracy is an idea that the imperial administration propagates to encourage everyone to take personal risks on behalf of the empire at no real cost to the empire. Those who fail in that effort are treated no differently from a pile of refuse, and the fact that they fail is rationalized as a personal failure and quickly forgotten by society at large. At least they're doing better than Reistis, Miss Gran said. They are, Ludmilla agreed. Aristides' martial institutions never advanced beyond a multitude of house traditions. Now, they are paying the price for their stagnation. This is, however, the same dilemma that you are facing now, Miss Gran. The Seneschal straightened in her seat with a surprised look. Dilemma? Me? You are leveraging institutions that are even more primitive than those of the local human nations, she told her. Ones that are so deeply entrenched that they are natural to your subjects. You have already mentioned your misgivings about being able to have the goblins assume specialized roles because their regular behavior tends to have them diversify their skill sets. I have said that, Miss Grant said, but, at the same time, I never considered it a problem problem. The goblins seem satisfied with what they have as it is. Should you not wish for your subjects to achieve the greatest degrees of success? Maybe that's a part of the issue, the Seneschal sighed. I haven't devised any tangible metrics to measure their progress with because so many of them appeared in such a short period. It may take years to figure it out. Actually, frontier territories in the Empire do take years or even decades to become productive by the Imperial Administration's standards. The pace in the Sorceress Kingdom is just ludicrous. Be that as it may, Ludmilla said, this is something you should address. We may criticize Reistis for becoming stagnant, but these wilderness tribes have been stagnant for far longer. You were among the first to offer them a way forward. Wow, no pressure, Miss Grand said. But, even if you say so, I don't have a clue what this way forward is. My lady has fought a goblin army before, how were they organized? Ludmilla fell silent for a moment, recalling the intelligence reports from the previous summer. In terms of their goblins, she said. The goblin army that invaded the upper reaches last summer was not any better organized than you are here. I would even go so far as to say it was worse. They formed specialized roles by race, hobgoblins served as officers and elite heavy infantry and bugbears were used as shock troops. Regular goblins were treated as everything from light infantry to servants who shouldered most of the army's logistical burdens. Of course, that included randomly becoming mobile snacks when provisions ran low. That's horrible. That was just how it was, Ludmilla shrugged, 
and I presume this is what your goblins expect under you. But I never said anything of the sort. Miss Grant protested, Gah, now I feel all sorry for them. Still, how do I enact any sort of change? Everything that they do seems instinctual and my efforts to educate them are slow at best. It is probably not as difficult as it seems, but I will not ruin your fun. Anyway, we should return to Warden's Vale before it gets too late. Thank you for entertaining us, Miss Gran. It's a pleasure to be of service, Lady Zaradnik. Oh, before I forget, did you read the diary entry I dropped off the other day? I did. Miss Gran grinned, it really is like a bard's tale. I can't believe Elena got married to the crown prince. They're even expecting their first child. She was just a girl from the country and everything. What did you think of, um, everything else? She quickly discovered that Miss Gran was just as obsessed with romance as Lian. The both of them became singularly focused on the topic and its related developments once they caught its scent. It's quite fantastical, the Seneschal said. Never mind the details of the wedding, even her everyday life has so many advancements that it makes my head spin. It's like she lives in the empire that people outside of the Baharuth Empire imagine it to be. So many different races live in the city, as well. It feels far more like a true empire than anything we have in the present day. I thought so, as well, Ludmilla agreed. It makes me wonder if countries elsewhere in the world achieved a similar level of advancement at the same time and whether they have been building off of it since however long ago these diary entries were written. I can't imagine what that might be like in the present day. Maybe they'd have ships and castles that fly in the air. Do you think they'd have gone to the moon by now? Queen Auriculus did mention some things along those lines when they were discussing the navigational beacon installed at Eastwatch. At first, she thought that the Queen was simply being whimsical, but, after reading more of Elena Grant's diary, Ludmilla decided that there was a strong possibility her musings were true. My question would be why we have not seen any sign of that sort of progress, Ludmilla said. I understand that we are considered some sort of savage backwater by the rest of the world, but we are still connected to the rest of the world by trade. As far as I know, merchants tend to not care what goods they handle so long as handling them is worth the risk. The Empire's markets occasionally do see weird things from the East, Miss Gran replied. There isn't anything too crazy, though. Imperial artisans have even reverse-engineered some of it, but it's also uninteresting that very little results from the effort. The best you might see is something along the lines of a desk fan or a fridge. My guess is that we get the stuff that no one else wants since we're on the very fringe of a continental trade route. I have heard that rationale before, Ludmilla said as she rose from her chair, but that should not stop people from going out to get some wondrous bit of technology or even information about advancements abroad. Governments should be especially keen on doing that. You are not wrong, Miss Gran rose to accompany them to the village harbour. Maybe there are measures in place to stop advanced technology from falling into the hands of barbarians, or maybe governments have gotten their hands on it and have all sorts of secret projects running to exploit the technology to their advantage. Somehow, Ludmilla didn't think the latter was the case. New goods and technology weren't the only things that came with commerce and it was new concepts and ways of thinking that held the greatest value. The latter two were far harder to stop from spreading. I suppose it is a mystery that will be unraveled when we get there. And the Sorceress Kingdom would get there, eventually. But, first, it had to get its own house in order.